Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Cabarrus County Board of Education, our business meeting tonight for April the 16th, 2012. At this time, what we would like to do is we uh, would like to have a moment of silent, silence uh, in memory. We had a senior from Central Cabarrus High School that passed away on uh, April the 1st. Uh, his name was Jared, um, hey, let me look here, Jared Bruce. And, uh, you know, it's such an unfortunate thing. And then also we had the death of one of our board members' father, uh, Mr. Albert Furr. We'd like to have a, a moment of silent prayer in, uh, for those families also. So if you'll join me in a moment of silent prayer. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Now, at this time, we're going to have the um, presentation of colors, and I'd like to announce to you who all is here uh, tonight. We've got representatives from Central Cabarrus High School, Junior ROTC, and also from Hickory Ridge High School. And the following cadets are the ones that will be taking part in the ceremony. Cadet Airman Justin Perez, he's at Hickory Ridge High School. Cadet Second Lieutenant Ashley Haas, Central Cabarrus High School, and Cadet Airman Corey Smith, Central Cabarrus High School, Cadet Technical Sergeant Devin Hefty from Hickory Ridge High School, and they're being led by Lieutenant Colonel Nelson English, United States Air Force, retired from Central Cabarrus High School, and Master Sergeant Dela Cruz. And so we would all stand for the presentation of colors.
And I don't know about you, but I'll tell you, it's always moving to me to hear the national anthem and to, you know, to see the colors presented. It's, I'm just proud to be an American, I'll tell you that. Okay, uh, board members, we're going to move on to uh, setting the agenda. We've had our agenda since uh, last week. Some of the things we worked on, as you know, in our work session. Do I have a motion that the agenda be uh, approved as presented? So moved. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay, the motion carries. The agenda set. Okay, now at this time, we're going to move on to our recognitions portion of the uh, uh, meeting tonight. I'd like to ask Miss Ronnie Boone to step up to the podium. She'll be doing the Impact Through Education Awards. And uh, Miss Boone, we thank you for being here. Thank you for always doing a good job for us on this. Good evening, everyone. This evening, we will be recognizing students and staff from Mount Pleasant Elementary and Mount Pleasant Middle Schools for our Impact Through Education Awards. At this time, we're going to begin with the uh, recognitions from Mount Pleasant Elementary School. And I'd like to invite any members of the Mount Pleasant Elementary administrative staff to please come forward to stand with your students and staff. so we can get you in the pictures. Our first honoree from Mount Pleasant Elementary School is Daisy Carmona Torres. Would Daisy and her family please come forward? Daisy is a fifth grade student at Mount Pleasant Elementary School who enjoys going to the movies, outdoor activities, and animals. According to a teacher, Daisy has always been a hard worker in all of her classes. She's been on the Mount Pleasant Elementary School Special Olympics team for three years and enjoys competing in the games. Her favorite events are the softball throw, standing long jump, and 50 meter dash. Daisy always enjoys meeting new people and making new friends at Special Olympics. She especially enjoys spending time with her high school buddy during the games. Daisy is a ROAR student, meaning she's always respectful, obedient, has an awesome attitude, and is responsible. Another teacher says Daisy is a sweet, wonderful, and respectful girl. She always thinks of others and has nothing but kindness in her heart. She works hard and wants to do well to please others. A third teacher states that there is not a single time that she has worked with Daisy that she has not had a smile on her face or a positive attitude. Daisy always treats others with respect and kindness. Despite her learning needs, Daisy is always willing to try and to complete tasks given to her to the best of her ability, and she never complains about her responsibilities. Daisy is loved and respected by her peers. She has brought joy to all who have worked with her. And her mother has a special note that she wanted us to share this evening. Daisy's mother says, The day you were born was truly the happiest day of my life. I congratulate you for everything you have achieved up to this point. We all love you. Congratulations, Daisy, on receiving an Impact Your Education Award. Our next honoree from Mount Pleasant Elementary is Brandon Smith. Would Brandon and his family please come forward? Brandon Smith is a fifth grade student at Mount Pleasant Elementary School, and he's an active member of his youth group at Mount Pleasant United Methodist Church. 
He has played recreational baseball since he was three years old and has played travel baseball for the past two years for the Carolina Lumberjacks. He has also played recreational basketball since he was five. He is a member of the Run Club at Mount Pleasant Elementary School and ran his first 5K in March with a time of 34 minutes and 27 seconds. Brandon loves to be outside riding the gator around his house and playing with his dog Belle. He loves to explore nature. His favorite summer activities are swimming with friends at his grandparents' house and going to the beach with his family. According to his teacher, Brandon is a wonderful role model to his peers and to younger students. He gives 110% to all of his endeavors, striving to please and always putting his best foot forward. He reaches out to include others in every aspect of school life. Oftentimes, he is the first to help other students who may be struggling. Students as well as teachers are complimentary of his sterling citizenship. His strong morals and beliefs are instilled deeply and show through every aspect of his life. He is a joy to have in the classroom. Congratulations, congratulations Brandon, and thank you for making a positive impact at Mount Pleasant Elementary School. Our next honoree from Mount Pleasant Elementary this evening is Mrs. Janet Childress. Would Ms. Childress and her family please come forward? Janet Childress has been a teacher for eight years at Mount Pleasant Elementary School. She's taught kindergarten and currently teaches fourth grade. She's married to Mark Childress and they have two children, Zachary and Jacob. She is a member of the Highland Baptist Church Praise Team in New London, North Carolina. She loves to sing, shop, teach, and reach out to fellow breast cancer survivors. A fellow teacher at Mount Pleasant Elementary says the following about Janet. Janet is a champion for her students despite facing a diagnosis of stage 3 breast cancer, surgeries, and treatment. She's always willing to try, new, try something new or reinventing the wheel in order to meet her students' needs. She shows them how to thrive in the classroom and in the world despite hardship. Janet has great energy and an inspiring attitude. According to her principal, Janet has been an inspiration to the entire staff. She met her breast cancer diagnosis as she does her teaching with a positive attitude, full of energy, and a willingness to try whatever works to achieve the best outcome. There is, there is a saying that you should not reinvent the wheel, but Janet can, cannot help but reinvent it over and over in her constant quest to be the best teacher she can be for her students. Congratulations, Janet, and thank you for making an impact at Mount Pleasant Elementary School. And our final honoree this evening from Mount Pleasant Elementary School is Mrs. Diane Boyd. Would Mrs. Boyd and her family please come forward? <clears throat> Diane Boyd has been empl employed by Cabarrus County Schools for seven years. She's married to Randy Boyd, and they have one daughter, Courtney, who is a senior at Mount Pleasant High School. 
She enjoys traveling, spending time with her family and friends, and showing and competing with her dogs at various venues. A fellow staff member says she's always willing to help out with anything at Mount Pleasant Elementary. Each morning, she leads the second through fifth graders in dance activities while the buses unload. She will drop whatever she's doing in the front office to help out with academic interventions, create teaching supplies for teachers, or to instruct a class in the computer lab. Her greatest concern is what is best for the students at Mount Pleasant Elementary. She truly makes a significant impact at the school. To use a baseball term, her principal considers her his utility player. While she is classified as a clerical employee, Diane is so much more. In the course of an average day, Diane watches students before school in the gym, teaches a reading mastery class, tutors second, third, fourth, and fifth grade students, teaches computer classes, helps, helps classroom teachers provide academic interventions to students, and finishes her day by walking kindergarten students out to the car rider area. In between those times, she watches classes for teachers who are having meetings, helps maintain the school's computers and website, and works in the front office. Her outstanding work ethic and positive attitude greatly impact the school each day. Congratulations, Diane, and thank you for making an impact in education. Next, we'll move on to our recognitions for Mount Pleasant Middle School. Would any members of the administrative team from Mount Pleasant Middle please come forward to stand with your students and staff? And our first honoree from Mount Pleasant Middle School this evening is Haley Shackelford. Would Haley and her family please come forward? Haley is a fun-loving, energetic, and eager student willing to take on academic challenges outside of her comfort zone. Haley is an active participant in a variety of school activities and currently serves as a student assistant in the Media Center. Her teachers report that she is always respectful toward all students and often aims to include others regardless of their diverse learning styles or social differences in all group activities. We appreciate Haley and all that she does to make a positive impact on education at Mount Pleasant Middle School. Congratulations, Haley. Our next Mount Pleasant Middle School honoree is Caleb Spears. Would Caleb and his family please come forward? Caleb is a multi-sport athlete who leads by example both on the athletic fields and in the hallways and classrooms of the school building. He is a responsible and conscientious student. Teachers describe Caleb as a young man with exceptional integrity and loyalty. 
He treats students and staff members with respect and is well known for his kindness that he extends to everyone. Caleb, we thank you for making a positive impact on education at Mount Pleasant Middle School. Our next Mount Pleasant Middle School honoree is Ms. Allison Cottingham. Would Ms. Cottingham and her family please come forward? Allison Cottingham teaches PACE at Mount Pleasant Middle School. Although relatively new to Cabarrus County, it didn't take Ms. Cottingham long to jump in and demonstrate how she could make an impact. She chairs the Bullying and Harassment Committee for the School Improvement Team, and this spring her committee led the school in a self-awareness activity that brought, brought poignant attention to bullying. Allison also took it upon herself to beautify the school's campus. She and her students planted bulbs, weeded and mulched areas around the campus, including the quad. Spirits are soaring this spring as the flowers took bloom and everyone is looking at, around at the, the wonderful work that they've done. Allison also makes a special impact instructionally. She led the profes professional development for all of the school's exceptional children's program teachers as they switched from handwritten individual education plans or IEPs to a computer-based version. She can be found assisting anyone that needs an extra hand. With a bright smile and a willingness to always go the extra mile, Ms. Cottingham definitely makes a grand impact at Mount Pleasant Middle School. Congratulations. And our final honoree from Mount Pleasant Middle School this evening is Ms. Melinda Helmentoller. Would Ms. Helmentoller and her family please come forward? Melinda Helmentoller took on a new position at Mount Pleasant Middle School this year. She formerly served as an assistant in the Media Center. She is now the school's Student Management Center Coordinator. Reducing discipline infractions and time away from the classroom are two areas of focus for Mount Pleasant Middle School. And Ms. Helmentoller is integral in helping the school to achieve positive results. Additionally, she collaborates with teachers to provide testing accommodations for students. In past years, she has helped with the Battle of the Books team and driven for various field trips. This year, she also served as the school's cheerleading coach. Ms. Helman -Toller, Toller is always willing to accept new challenges and responsibilities that extend beyond her role as Student Management Center Coordinator. She builds and maintains strong relationships with students and holds students to high standards while they are under her supervision. Thank you, Ms. Helman Toller, for making a positive impact on education at Mount Pleasant Middle.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, that was some nice recognitions there. I noticed they were all from Mount Pleasant, too. Ain't that good? Okay, we're going to move on now, and we have um, the Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month Award that will be presented by Dr. Barry Shepard, our superintendent, and Mr. Tim Vaughn from Hilbish Ford, if you'd come to the podium, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, board members. Tonight's a very special night for us as we recognize the Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month. Since announcing our partnership with Hilbish Ford to recognize a deserving Cabarrus County Schools teacher last April, we have received more than 300 nominations from our students, parents, and employees who have happily shared their stories about the outstanding teachers in Cabarrus County Schools. So tonight, on this, the first anniversary of this wonderful program, I would just like to share with you, Tim, how grateful we are to Hilbish Ford for its support of Cabarrus County Schools and how much we appreciate the recognition your organization provides for our teachers. We look forward to our continued partnership. Tonight, I'm pleased to announce that the Cabarrus County Schools Hilbish Ford Teacher of the Month for April is Ms. Cheryl Weatherman. Ms. Weatherman, would you, your family members, and any members of your school administrative team please come forward? Ms. Weatherman is a 7th and 8th grade AIG math teacher at Concord Middle School. And she was nominated for this month's award by a student who wrote, Mrs. Weatherman is a teacher who truly cares about her students' education. She works hard every day for her students and helps them understand the concepts of each lesson. The student also added that Mrs. Weatherman has a smile that brightens up the classroom each day. She knows how to relate algebra to everyday life and how it will impact us in the future. I think you should award Mrs. Weatherman this award for her many years with Cabarrus County Schools and for the love, respect, and care she has for her students. Mrs. Weatherman, on behalf of the Cabarrus County Schools, we thank you for all you do to instill a love of learning in your students and for making their time in your classroom a treasured experience. Now Mr. Vaughn has a couple of items for you. Let's give them a round of applause. Okay, moving right along, we'd like to have Dr. Colleen Sane to the podium, and she'll be making a presentation tonight uh, for the Muscular Dystrophy Association. Dr. Sane. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and board members. I would like to introduce to you tonight Brian Foster. Brian, would you and your parents please come forward? It's no speed zone. <laughs> Bryson, sorry, thank you. My apologies, Bryson. Bryson has been selected as the 2012 Muscular Dystrophy Association's National Goodwill Ambassador. He is a fifth grader at Carley Fir Elementary. Although Bryson's selection as National Goodwill Ambassador was officially announced at a press conference in February, we are excited to honor Bryson and his parents, Claire and Phil Foster, this evening. Throughout the coming year, Bryson and his parents will travel the country representing families affected by neuromuscular diseases and those served by MDA. Bryson will participate in special events and meetings hosted by national MDA sponsors and speak to the media about MDA. A self-proclaimed sports fanatic, Bryson hosts his own weekly sports talk show program at the school. He's also an honor roll student at Fur Elementary Cabarrus County Schools is proud to recognize Bryson for his selection as National Goodwill Ambassador. 
We know Bryson's engaging personality and positive outlook will make a lasting impression on everyone he meets this year. Okay, board members, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on now to uh, Dr. Colleen Sane will still be at the podium, and you're going to have Cliff Moyer come up with you, and we're going to see the um, Energy Management Logo Contest winner. Earlier this year, the Energy Management Department sponsored a logo design contest. And tonight, Mr. Cliff Maurer, our energy manager, is here to introduce the contest winner. Cliff? I'd like to ask uh, Bobby Lear and uh, Mrs. Kate Highsmith to come forward, please. Both from Mount Pleasant High School. Hey. Hey. This year, I, it was one of my goals to involve our student body in our energy plan, our energy management plan. And, um, excuse me, I was at a class at NC State, and the, and the guy was giving a lecture, and he said, you know, when you got a new program, you need a logo. So the idea was born, and we brought it back and talked about it, and we decided that we would use all the high school's art departments to create a logo for our new program. And um, Bobby submitted the winning logo. We have electronic copy. Uh, we do. If we don't, I do have the original that he submitted. Did a great job. Can you hold it? Hang on. Let him hold it so I can take his picture. Okay. Go ahead. And to finish up our contest, you have to have a prize. So we talked with local retailers and Walmart uh, graciously gave us a $100 gift card that would go to the art department at the school that won the contest, which is here in this envelope. And for Bobby, we have a certificate of appreciation for outstanding achievements in the energy management logo contest. Thank you. Right, we're going to move on to 5.5 in our agenda tonight, and that I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Gary Calamari to the podium, and he's going to be making uh, some presentations for State Athletic Awards. Now, could I have Garrison White and his family come up, please?
Garrison White is a senior at Robinson High School. He's also a state wrestling champion this year. His career record is 216 and 7, with 148 of those in pins. He is a three time state champion in 112, 125, and 126 pound weight class. In 2011 2012, he was na nationally ranked eighth in Win Magazine. He was a four time North Carolina State uh, Midwest Regional Champion. Uh, he was also the Midwest Regional Most Outstanding Wrestler of the Year for this year. He was of the state tournament, he was also the most outstanding wrestler. 2011 2012, the Charlotte Observer Wrestler of the Year. And his GPA, uh, GPA is a 4.80. He will be attending Northwestern University on a wrestling scholarship. We'd like to congratulate him on his accomplishments here. Griffin Fiedler and his parents, please come up. <laughs> Griffin is also a J. Robinson High School student, but he is a swimming champion, state champion. The 2012 state champion in the 100-yard butterfly. He was also the champion for the South Piedmont Conference. He was Alcabarras Male Wrestler of the Year. 2012 regional champion. 2012 state runner-up in the 200-yard freestyle, the 400-yard uh, freestyle relay. And his GPA is 4.6. We'd like to congratulate him on his uh, accomplishment. Amanda Porter and her family from Concord High School. Mandy Porter is the North Carolina Athletic Trainer of the Year for the secondary schools of our state. She is a member of the, of the NATA and she had to be nominated by a member of the NATA. Um, the selection was made by an awards committee. Uh, she's, uh, the sponsor needed to uh, submit a letter of recommendation to this committee. It was based on dedication and service, hard work, commitment to the school, to the student athletes of Concord High School. Mandy is a valuable asset to Cabarrus County Schools and to the sports medicine community of North Carolina. Uh, Scott Barringer considers her one of the most skilled and dedicated athletic trainers he has worked with, Mandy Porter.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, our next award um, is, is 5.6 on your agenda. It's the Youth Art Month Awards. Dr. Barry Shepard, you have the podium. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. Last month, we celebrated Youth Art Month. And uh, for those of us who work here in the Education Center and our visitors, that uh, we've had the pleasure of seeing the lobby decorated with a variety of artwork for our, from our students. And if you haven't had a chance to review the gallery, I encourage you to do so very soon. Uh, we've had some very talented artists in Cabarrus County Schools. And uh, each year, as part of our Youth Art Month observation, I'm faced with the daunting but fun task of selecting three new art pieces to add to the superintendent's permanent art collection. The Cabarrus County Education Foundation has once again graciously offered a monetary gift of $100 to each student artist whose artwork is selected for the collection. Tonight, we recognize the students whose artwork I selected during our Youth Art Month activities. And I'm pleased to be joined tonight by Ms. Jeanette Trexler from the Cabarrus County Education Foundation, who will present these talented young artists with their gifts. And Jeanette, if you would please come forward and if you'd like to say a few words on behalf of the foundation. Boy, this feels comfortable right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is indeed my privilege and honor to say a few words about the Education Foundation. The foundation exists solely for the support and honor of teachers and students. Um, we have been um, providing the monetary reward for the last number of years. I can't even remember how many years the foundation has provided the $100 for each student. And it's indeed our pleasure to do it again this year. I also wanted to recognize that on your board, Holly Blackwelder and Grace Monnet are on the Cabeers County Education Foundation, as well as Dr. Shepard. You, you hang on to those. I'm going to let you present them under there. Okay. All right, now students, when I call your names, please come forward and Ms. Boone has your artwork that she will uh, hand to you. And uh, we want your art teacher to come forward also to receive the gift. And uh, so I'm pleased now to present our, our elementary winner, Mr. Caleb Malin. And Caleb is a second grader at Bethel Elementary School. Caleb. Caleb's ink and watercolor piece, Mount Fuji, was selected for the elementary level. And Caleb's teacher is Mr. Daniel, uh, David Nickel. Is Mr. Nickel with us tonight? All right. And Ms. Trexler has something there for you, did you? Okay, you've already handed it. Great. Thank you so much, Caleb. Would you shake the hand of our board members, please? Okay, uh, and now I'd like to ask Amber Howell and her art teacher and family members to come forward as well. Amber Howell. She's not here. Okay. We have track meet tonight. Is that She's right? <laughs> well, then this will just give me a chance here uh, to, to brag for a couple of things. First of all, Aunt Amber is an eighth grader at Winkler Middle School, and her piece titled Midnight Howl is a combination of cardboard and paint. And Amber's art teacher is Miss Lori Earnhardt. And Ms. Earnhardt organized this year's art contest and art display for us. So I get to thank you for the good work you did there and also to honor your student and the great artwork there. So let's give her a round of applause.
Thank you, Lord. And finally, Mr. Ben Osborne. I don't know if any, anyone else joined me on uh, early morning. Uh, I think uh, Larry Sprinkle and Channel 6, was it, Ben? Come forward. Yay. All right. Woke up and saw that on the news one day. First of all, I thought, how early did they have to get up to be there? But to our art students were honored from uh, many of our schools. And uh, it was, was it Concord? Concord High. Concord High. And uh, many of our good artists there. So Ben's a senior at Concord High School. And he used colored pencils to create his piece called Marbles. That's not a photograph. That's, a, that's colored pencils. That's amazing. Ben's art teacher is Miss Nancy Johnson. And we're so proud of the good work that's going on there. Uh, and Ben, uh, congratulations to you, and uh, Ms. Trexler has something that she would like to honor you with. And if you would please just shake the member of our Board of Education. Well, we got just a couple more recognitions here, and then we'll be winding up the recognitions part. Uh, the next on our agenda is 5.7, the Young Authors and Forever Young Authors. And I'd like to ask Ms. Tara Natris and Dr. Cheryl Milam if they're here to come to the podium so that we can uh, make these presentations. Good evening. We are happy to be here this evening to present to you our Young Author and Forever Young Author winners and to celebrate with their families. Each year, the North Carolina Reading Association and the local county groups sponsor the Young Authors Contest to showcase writers in our schools from every grade level, as well as our faculty and staff in the Forever Young Authors category. The topic this year was the Treasures of North Carolina. Pieces included a variety of genres and were scored on ideas, organization, and voice. We are proud of our county winners who were also recently recognized at the State Reading Convention in Raleigh and had their writing published. So we will now call forward our winners. We'll start with Fur Elementary School. So if we have any members of the leadership team from Fur, if you'd like to come forward. And our third grade student from FUR is Lauren D. Oreo, and she is being recognized for her piece, The Wizard of Oz North Carolina Trip. Lauren, if you would please come forward. Congratulations, <laughs> Congratulations Lauren. We'd now like to honor our winners from Boger. And I'd like to invite any members of the leadership team from Boger up. And we'd like to honor Leah Long, a second grader, for her piece, Bald Head Island. And she's not here this evening, so we would also like to honor from Boger Andrew Trick, a third grader for Grammy and Papa's Place at the Lake. <laughs> Congratulations, Andrew.
Our next winners will be from Harrisburg Elementary School. If we have any members of the leadership team from Harrisburg, please come on up. And we will start by honoring Griffin Poplar, a second grader from Harrisburg for Blackbeard the Pirate. Okay, and Zachary Billiar, a third grade student for the Treasured Pumpkin. Lauren Grams, a fourth grader, a treasure of North Carolina, the birth of my baby sister. <laughs> Sharla Kirkpatrick, a fourth grader for the cave. And Kelsey Embler, a fifth grader, my North Carolina treasure is the Sunset Beach. Congratulations, Kelsey. And next, we have our winners from Pitt School Road. If we have any representatives from Pitt School, please come forward. And the first winner we'd like to honor is James Bells, a third grade student for Babe Ruth's Big Hit. Congratulations, James. <laughs> um, we have one more if you want to wait, or we can do it now. Go ahead. <laughs> Get the little guys to go. And we have Elijah Grafton, a fourth grader for the Treasure in Blackbeard. Congratulations, Elijah. And next, we'll honor our winners from R. Brown McAllister. If we have any members from R. Brown, please come on forward. And we would first like to honor Cameron Cobb, a fourth grader for the piece Red Wolves. <coughs> And we'd also like to honor Jack Lippard, a fifth grade student for North Carolina's Four Corners. Congratulations, Jack.
And finally, we have our winners from Odell. If we have any members from Odell, this administrative team, please come forward. And we'd like to begin by honoring Adrian Atkins, a second grader for Oak Island, My Treasure. Congratulations, Adrian. <laughs> and next we have Nicholas Eisenhart for Sliding Rock. Congratulations, Nicholas. And we have Morgan Simmons, a second grader for the Panthers Rule. Congratulations, Morgan. And we have Austin Smith, a fifth grader, for treasures I found in North Carolina. Congratulations, Austin. Next, we have the middle school winners. If there's a member of the administrative team from CC Griffin, will that person please come forward? Our first winner from CC Griffin is Cassidy McGirt. Cassidy's entry is the Cardinals song. Another winner from C.C. Griffin Middle, a seventh grader, Keeley Curry, the spirit of North Carolina.
Wait, wait, wait. One more. <laughs> no one should have missed your big picture. Congratulations, Keely. <laughs> Next, we have winners from J.N. Freeze Magnet School. Will the representative from J.N. Freeze please come forward? Our first winner is a sixth grader, Stephen Monroe. His entry is NASCAR, a treasure of North Carolina. Congratulations, Stephen. <laughs> Our next winner is a seventh grader from JN Freeze, Daisy Tucker. Her entry is North Carolina barbecue, Shakespeare style. <laughs> Congratulations, Daisy. Next is an eighth grader from J.N. Freeze, Merrill Douglas, the Blue Ridge Parkway. Next from J.N. Freeze, an eighth grader, Olivia Leopard, worth more than gold. Okay. Thank you, Mrs. Burkhart. That, that was the last one from J.N. Freeze. Next, from Northwest Cabarrus Middle, if there is an administrator from Northwest Cabarrus Middle, please come forward. First winner from Northwest is an eighth grader, Emily Absher, Lasting Treasures. And the final winner from eighth grade, Northwest Cabarrus Middle, Karen Stahl, my grandmother. Next, we have our Forever Young authors. These are adults in our school system who continue to create. From Harrisburg Elementary School, Karen Gehrig, Treasured Traditions. Also from Harrisburg, Denise Harrelson, North Carolina Tree. Congratulations. <laughs> also from Harrisburg, Janet Newman, coming home to Carolina. Not here. Our next adult winner, Forever Young Authors, from C.C. Griffin Middle, is Deborah Eford, an unforgettable treasure, the Duke Chapel. Thank 
Congratulations, Deborah. Our final young, forever young author winner is Lori Perry from C.C. Griffin, New Beginnings. Congratulations to all the forever young authors. We thank them for continuing to learn and grow and create. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, board members, 5.8, the Subway School Health Champion. I'd like to ask Ms. Donna Smith to the podium. And I'd like to ask Laura Bryant to come forward, Alice Lutman, and Corey Cochran. We have a threesome here. As they're coming, I'd like to introduce Laura Bryant as the school nurse at Mount Pleasant Elementary, Corey Cochran being the principal at Mount Pleasant Elementary, and Alice Lutman, who is a nurse supervisor with Cabarrus Health Alliance. Please come all together. Thank you. <laughs> the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction and the North Carolina State Board of Education, in partnership with Subway and Tar Heel Sports Properties, are sponsoring the Subway School Health Champion of the Year Award. Two champions are selected each month. And a nominee must be a healthy role model that demonstrates or who demonstrates outstanding leadership in advancing school-based policies and programs improving the health of students and staff. Corey Cochran describes Laura in this manner. Due to her exemplary performance as a school nurse, her commitment to support health education, a healthy school environment, physical activity, staff wellness, and community involvement, Laura Bryant is an outstanding candidate for the Subway School Health Champion. Laura's leadership is demonstrated in many ways. She has introduced energizers at Mount Pleasant, which are activities to help teachers integrate physical activity into the school day. She's helped with fundraising to purchase an AED, which is technical for automatic external defibrillator. We know it better as AEDs. And she also teaches open airway path asthma classes to students. She mentors and advises new nurses to their positions and does a lot of community involvement, particularly in recruiting volunteers for the Mur Murdoch program. A lot of words. <laughs> I am so pleased to announce that Laura Bryant has been selected as the February Subway School Health Champion. She serves as the school nurse at Mount Pleasant Elementary and has been in this position for nine years. The competition does continue. And all monthly winners, Laura being one of them now, will be treated to a dinner and a basketball game at the Smith Center in December when the officially the 2012 Subway School Health Champion of the Year for the state will be recognized at halftime during that game. Our congratulations really go to Nurse Bryant tonight who is representing our district so well in your advocacy and your leadership for student and staff wellness. Thank you, Laura. Okay, board members, we have one final award tonight. It's uh, 5.9, Dr. Barry Shepard, the Association of School Businesses. Mr. Chair, would you please join me here in the front and present uh, on behalf of uh, the Association of School Business Officials, the Certificate of Excellence in Finance, Financial Reporting Award. I'm pleased to share that uh, the Cabarrus County Education, Board of Education has received this award um, for the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2011. Uh, the award represents a very significant achievement and reflects our Board of Education's commitment to the high standard of school system financial reporting. And at this time, I'd like to ask Ms. Kelly Klutz to join you, please, that you can present this award. The Certificate of Excellence Award is sponsored by Valak an industry, industry excuse me, leader in long-term investment programs for thousands of not-for-profit and for-profit education, healthcare, and public sector organizations. 
Receiving this award confirms our finance department's commitment to financial accountability and transparency. Under Ms. Klutz's leadership, this pursuit of excellence has resulted in our school system's continued financial solvency, particularly during these challenging economic times. Mr. Chairman and Ms. Klutz, we offer our congratulations and appreciations for receiving the Certificate of Excellence Award. Thank you and congratulations. Well, you know, we shook everybody else's hand, so we might as well go ahead and get Kelly's, you know. We surely appreciate it. And uh, anyway, if you hadn't had your hand shook tonight, you just need to get in line. <laughs> okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on now to um, the uh, 6.0, the approval of the minutes. Board members, you've had, uh, had a chance to read the minutes from the March 5th, March 12th, and the March 22nd uh, meetings. Uh, do we have any changes or do we have a motion to accept the minutes as presented? Okay, I have a motion and a second that the minutes be approved as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, motion carries. Okay, next we move down to 7.0 where we have the board chair comments and uh, also coming up will be Dr. Shepherd's comments. And I, I do have a few things that I want to uh, make known. I don't know whether those of you that came to the Education Center today or not noticed that we had the flag flying out there under the North Carolina flag, which is the National Donate Life Month. is uh, April set aside for that and uh, in observance of Donate Life Month. And I wanted to read to you, this was on the website, but I wanted to read this to those that are viewing this by YouTube or on uh, the television. This month, Cabarrus County Schools joins with others around the nation to observe National Donate Life Month. Throughout the month, Americans are encouraged to register as an organ, eye, and tissue donor and to celebrate those who have saved lives through the gift of donation. An outgrowth of the celebratory month is the Flags Across America initiative that began in 2009. It honors and celebrates the hundreds of thousands of donors and recipients whose lives have been affected by organ, eye, and tissue donation. The initiative rallies every donor, hospital, and transplant center to collectively fly the Donate Life flag during the month of April. Cabarrus County Schools is proud to have a Donate Life flag flying in front of the Education Center. This flag, along with the thousands of others that are flying throughout the United States, is a visible and unified statement about the importance of donation and reflects the dire need for donors. For those of you that know me, I am a recipient, a heart recipient, and a kidney recipient. And it's, you know, in other words, I'm here tonight because of someone donating an organ to me and has allowed me to have 17 years additional life that I would not have had had I not had the heart transplant in 1995. And so, you know, I'm proud that Cabarrus County Schools, along with Cabarrus County, along with the nation, has set aside April as the National Donate Life Month. And if you're not registered to be an organ, tissue, or eye donor, now would be a good time to entertain that thought. Okay, I also wanted to make a couple of other announcements here just real quickly. You may remember in one of our work sessions here recently, we were wanting to make applications to uh, the state in reference to some qualified school construction bonds, the uh, section two of that, which was somewhere around $12 million. And there were 20 additional uh, school districts that had applied for those funds. Unfortunately, Cabarrus County Schools was not one of those that was selected. There were four counties that were selected and these counties were ones that did not receive the QSCB money in the beginning. So, you know, I wish that we could have got some of that to complete some of the projects that we've had on tap, but uh, maybe someday we'll see this come around again and we'll apply again. And, uh, you know, I know that uh, I, I feel good that we applied and I'd rather try and fail as to not try at all. And we did try, we just didn't get it. And so I fully understand. And also one more announcement that I wanted to make from the office of the county manager 
You remember we talked about the budget items that we need, you know, different things uh, for facilities and maintenance all throughout the county school system and somewhere in the range of 180 million plus of needs that the county school system has. And if you remember, we, I had asked that we have a joint meeting between the Cabarrus County Commissioners and the Cabarrus County Board of Education along with our superintendent and the county manager. Well, I'm pleased to announce to you that we do have that meeting scheduled for May the 10th. It will be in the multi-purpose room uh, at the governmental center. And so I want the board members to, to remember and put that date on your calendar for May the 10th at, uh, uh, let's see, four o'clock on the 10th of May at the multi-purpose room at the governmental center. And uh, one final thought, and that is, as we're nearing the end of the year, graduations is coming around the corner, end of the year, all the things that take place, all the events, uh, like to encourage all of you to attend as many of those as you can in support of whichever one that you are part of. And I'd like to also encourage you, the students, uh, to put this last minute push on things to get your GPAs up, get your classes and everything that you need. So when it comes time for the fall, when you start college somewhere, hopefully you will be set and good to go. So that's all I have tonight is the chair comments. I'd like to ask Dr. Shepard if he has some comments at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few. Uh, I'd like to highlight the following items this evening. First, I want to welcome our students and staff back from spring break and uh, just remind them of the end of grade and end of course exams just around the corner. As you pointed out, graduation coming soon for those that are in that position. So I uh, just want all of our students and staff to stay focused and finish the year strong. Um, also this month, Cabarrus County Schools is supporting Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation in its annual fundraising campaign. Many of our schools and our central office will be sponsoring activities in support of JDRF. Uh, our district will also support the organization in its annual Walk to Cure Diabetes on April the 28th. Also starting today, parents can complete our annual Parent Satisfaction Survey. The survey is available online on our district website and is an opportunity for parents to provide us with feedback about critical school issues. Paper copies of the survey are available at your child's school if you don't have a computer or internet access. And the survey will be open through May the 4th. Later this week, the Cabarrus County Special Olympics will be held, will hold its, uh, host its annual spring games. And the Cabarrus County School student athletes will participate in the games on April the 18th and 19th. And during the opening ceremonies on the 18th, the Black Daggers, the official U.S. Army Special Operations Command Parachute Demonstration Team will perform a live aerial exercise. And the U.S. Army Band also will perform at the opening ceremonies. Many uh, of our Cabarrus County Schools employees will be involved in this event over the course of the week. And finally, I have some exciting news I'd like to share with you. Uh, Cabarrus County Schools is proud to announce a new partnership with the Howard Lee Institute for Equity and Opportunity in Education. We're one of five school systems in the state that will be a part of the pilot program designed to improve academic achievement in male African American and Hispanic students. The Lee Institute is based in Raleigh and was founded by the former chair of the State Board of Education and former state senator Howard Lee. The Institute is committed to transforming young lives through collaboration and cooperation by forming partnerships with organizations and institutions committed to helping at-risk students overcome adverse circumstances and graduate from high school ready for a career or college. Through its work with the Cabarrus County Schools, the Lee Institute will begin a program with the Logan Community Concord High School and J.M. Robinson High School. I've asked Dr. Robert Kirk, to coordinate this effort on behalf of our school system. Dr. Kirk is a natural selection to lead this project. He has a heart for students who struggle academically and the skill set needed to engage and involve the community. We're looking forward to this collaboration with the Lee Institute and we'll have a planning meeting with the key stakeholders in the coming weeks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes my comments for the evening. Thank you, Dr. Shepard, for that report. Okay, board members, we're moving on now to uh, 10, the action agenda. 
And at this time, I'd like to ask Ms. Kelly Klutz to come to the podium, whereas we're going to be talking about uh, the adoption. Oh, hold it. I, hold, yeah, I did. I, I'm sorry. I did. I, I had it on it already, and then I moved on beyond it. So anyway, we need to move on. Kelly, I'll hang on just for a minute. This won't take but a minute. The uh, 9.1, the approval of the consent agenda. And uh, board members, you've had a chance to look at this. We've talked about it at the work session. And so at this time, I'd accept a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. I have a motion. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7 0. Now we can move on to 10 with Ms. Kelly Klutz for the adoption or discussion on the proposed budget for 2012 13. And Ms. Klutz, you're good to go now. Thank you, sir. Um, at our work session, I presented the um, proposed budget to you, and there were um, a question or two. You wanted some additional information, and um, I'm <coughs> providing that to you tonight. The, I have four slides for you that I'll just review. I've had an opportunity to review those, but I'll um, just go over those quickly for you. Um, as I heard Ms. Minette's question, um, it's not exactly as you stated it, but um, as what I heard you say was, what, what do we... What do taxpayers get for your money? Or what are we getting for what, we, what we're um, paying for? And so I just wanted to give you a little bit of background information. Um, six out of the eight years that Cabarrus County Schools have been funded at 114 of 115 dis districts in the state. So as I translate that data, um, basically what we're saying is that we receive the least amount of money out of 115 school districts in the state. Um, so we, we don't receive um, uh, very much um, money as opposed to the other systems in the state. Um, that's just some data for you. And this is the, the details of that data. Um, from 2011 to going back to 2004, I've given you the rank at the state level the federal level and the local level. State is the most significant. We're ranked the highest at 115 in 2011. Going down, um, you can see in 2005, we, we ranked 110, which, was, which means we received a little bit more money than we usually do. Um, if you see at the federal level, it's not as, um, as difficult, um, but the, the numbers aren't very low. Local, we don't, we, we're not too difficult. It's not too bad for us at the local level, but when it is equated out and averaged out at the total level, we're still pretty high in our funding. Um, we're, not, we're not funded very high at all. Ms. Klutz, before we move on, can you elaborate on that just a little bit? On the prior slide primarily, primary. the, the one that, you know, that uh, we received the least amount of money per pupil. Mm -hmm. why, why is that? Why is that? Um, some of the funding formulas that the state um, gives the funding to systems for, it's based on low, there's low wealth formulas, and we're not a low wealth system, so we don't get a lot of those funds, or we don't get any of those funds for low wealth, and so that would make our per pupil funding lower. Um, also, it's determined based on test scores also, and we don't get a lot of, of those funds either. So there's, based on those um, those funding formulas, we do not receive some of those fundings. When, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. When you say test scores, because they're too good, uh, they are not. They are not low enough to receive okay. funding. I thought that's what you meant. But I wanted to clarify that. Yes, I'm not saying that we can't improve. I'm saying that we don't. Ours aren't low enough that we could receive additional funding for them. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so the next slide is, these are our bragging rights. So I've told you that we don't get much money, but I, I also want to say that we do a good job with the money that we get. It's not all negative. So I wanted to, um, I wanted to tell you some of the things that we do good. Cabarrus County Schools has the second highest graduation rate among the, the top 10 largest school districts in North Carolina, and that's that's pretty good. And I'm just going to read these to you, not that you can't read it, but I, they're, they're good things and I want everyone to know um, what, what we have to brag about. Um, middle school reading at 78% and middle school math at 85% were the highest in the district history last year. And Cabarrus County Schools has been in the top 10 of student performance in U.S. history for the last four years. 
Cabarrus County Schools was one of the five districts in North Carolina named to the annual college board honor roll for increasing AP scores and student participation. Last year, AP participation increased 19%. 13 of our 19 elementary schools have proficiency rates above 80%. And all eighth grade uh, tested subjects are in the top 25 in student performance of 115 districts in the state of North Carolina. So we think those are really good things that we're doing. Okay. The next one, um, there was one question that was directed, I think, to our staff and how we use our funds for our staff. And this slide, I hope, will address that question. Um, now, this is um, completely different, but this is how I think about it. I think of um, when we have a teacher in a classroom that's taking care of 20 or 25 or 30 students, I think of this the same way. This is a ratio of how many adults or to um, students. So it's a ratio to um, employees to um, student size or ADM or LEA size. So that's what we're, it's a measure for us so that we can be comparable to other school systems. And that's what we've done with this data. And so as we, we, we took this measure and we looked at other systems, we said um, this is our ratio of central office employees administration and support staff and we looked at other school systems that were similar to us whether it was as in size or whether they were in location close to us and we said what is their ratio as compared to ours and we we are one person to 180 students if you look at at us on the one side of the scale and if you look at the the system on the other side of the scale they're closer to one at, and I'm, you know, one, 115 or 110. Um, so they're serving one to 115, and we're serving one at 180 type example. So it's just to, to give you a measure of how we're serving our population. Um, we're serving more than a, a different um, system our size or in, if you measure them similarly in size. So we think that this is data to support that we know that we're working hard. We feel it every day and we wanted you to be able to see it in a graphical form. <laughs> okay. And I'll take questions. Okay, board members, you have this presentation from Ms. Klutz and you've had the uh, the other budget information from prior work sessions and prior budget meetings and all of that. So we'd like to open the floor now for uh, our first round of uh, budget discussions. And so we'd like to start on Mr. Fur's side. If you have questions pertaining to the slides, pertaining to the budget, now's the time. Let's get it cleared. We'll do two rounds. And I'd ask that each board member not speak a second time until each board member has spoke at least one time. Mr. Fur. Uh, uh, Kelly, I appreciate the data and just a big congratulations to, to all the people in this system. It shows that we do, a, do, do quite a bit with less, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I sent a request and a copy of you on it today, just asking for some data, maybe by the end of the week. And um, the comment I heard um, frequently since the last meeting was, how can you serve more students without increasing staff? And so it got me to thinking um, when I saw Kelly's slide, we, there's been a similar slide about the ranking of administrative positions and whatnot, but my question, or where we rank in the number of administrative positions, my question has been over the years, how do we know the districts compare the same things? So some of the data I asked for was, for example, how many um, certified student-facing dollars positions are in non-student facing roles. So for example, if we have positions in the county office here, they are non-student facing, they are not in front of 25 to 35 students a day. That's what I mean. People who are in supervisory lead positions, they might even be in the school, but they're not in front of, they're not a student to teacher ratio person delivering instruction. Um, 
And so how many positions do we have that are, um, if you will, pulled out of the classroom? I'm very concerned that if we have six to 700 more kids, and it could be a whole lot more, could be less, but that's, the state is generally close on their, their assumptions. Um, how do we serve those when, you know, six, seven years ago, um, when my last child was in high school, we were already having classrooms of 35 kids. I'm hearing now that we have classrooms close to 40, if not 40. So you've taken a high school teacher, um, we've taken a high school teacher who maybe previously um, had 75 to 80 students and is now in that same day serving maybe 105 to 120 students. That's a huge difference in workload when they're dealing with all the differentiation, the report cards, the IEPs, all the paperwork they're dealing with. And so it got me to thinking when I had several comments about how can you not raise any staff? So I asked Kelly before the meeting, um, had there been any discussion of what I'll call equivalence? For example, if we look at and we can obtain two positions out of the total population of APs. Each of those APs could be two classroom teachers based on 12 month at a higher salary into two 10 month positions. So I'd really like for staff to be thinking about as we're you know, getting our numbers, and I know we have kindergarten registration done, um, but there'll be continue to be people who register over the summer and whatnot, that we need to be thinking about that we need to hold a line on some classrooms. I did not find it acceptable when my children were in classes with 35 some years ago. Our classrooms don't even have physical space in the older schools for 35 kids, yet alone 40. Um, and I don't think it's fair to teachers to be asking them to deliver on the same salary worth less money now than it was even four or five years ago. And I know we're all in that boat. I'm, I'm personally in that boat. but. Um, to, to now deliver and do all the paperwork for maybe 105, 120 kids. You know, the classes were at 25, 27 for a reason. So um, anyway, so I'm, I'm concerned about that element in the budget. I don't know that we have a lot of choice. This is still a proposed budget, but I really want staff, before we get to our June meeting and the budget approval, I really want staff to be thinking about, we'll know some of the increase in ADM by then, um, about how we, um, keep the class size under some control. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Furtenbaugh. Ms. Blackwelder? No questions, Ms. Blackwelder? Okay, Mr. Kyer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, on your the, the ratio comparison, mm -hmm. those were, and you, I think you said this, I just want to make sure, these were systems that we pulled to compare ourselves against. This isn't necessarily, we're the furthest end of the scale no. looking back. Okay. We pulled these. Okay. Mm -hmm. Out of 115, we pulled these based on size or because they were similar in size or they were regionally located. Um, just we pulled those because of similarities. D did you happen to look? And if you if you don't know, what, I mean, what what the average? Are we below the average? Above the average? Or do we know statewide? You know, and I'm, I'm I, sorry I didn't think did, of asking that previously when I was looking at this. I just this was pulled curiosity. from HR, and he did not pull 115 because this was a, this was a significant amount of work. It okay. took him about two months to pull all of this data, um, so he didn't pull 115. Right. So I, I don't think we can answer that question. That, that's fine. I just was curious of where we stood. But again, I'm going to echo what Mr. Fur said. We we do a lot with uh, with what we have in front of us, and you know what I was taught. That's the way you go about doing everything. You know, whatever you do, do the best you can with what you have. And uh, again, if we size up, as Ms. Furtenbaugh has pointed out, if there's needs and things that we need to address, then we need to do that. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as the attitude of the people that are in this district and the, the way they go about doing their job, my hat's off to them. They do a tremendous job. And again, this, this shows uh, some of the, the constraints that uh, they're up against and uh, they do a, an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kiger. Ms. Carpenter. And I was trying to get back to the other, the our first, uh, where we were in the budget, because uh, on this one it doesn't have the, the whole budget right. numbers. You know the 3% that you added back in on the 
the regular budget part, that 3%, was that just for the teacher's salary when we were going in? That was the local portion for anyone locally paid, but that's based on a projection that we could possibly get a 3%. Race. But would it be just for the teachers, or would that be for any of the local staff? That's ass that's assuming that it would be system wide. So and it would be. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's just assuming that's the an state assumption. assumption. This, but so it wouldn't just be just for the teachers. It would be any of the local then, three percent for that. So that could be everybody then. That's what that number was but that is a complete assumption okay so it's not just the teachers it's not okay because see i was kind of iffy with that because you've got that amount in there mm -hmm. but then also you've got that one million in there mm -hmm. for the salary study mm -hmm. and see that's where i've got some some problem because that's uh you're saying the one million for the salary study and where I'm getting kind of confused with that one million. Mm -hmm. Have we actually com is the salary study actually complete? Mm -mm. And 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 where I'm kind of you know, I don't mind asking for something. You know, I know we're going to have we're going to need something with it, but my thing is, you know, I know how times are. Mm -hmm. We know what's being faced. Uh, I would rather go after something that I know I can get and what's reasonable where you can put a number on something. I know that we've got areas that we know that we are desperately in need that we can't get, uh, different positions that we know that we can't, that we're not able to get. And I would rather see us put that number out there we know that we're having trouble in the IT area. We know we're having trouble in uh, possibly some areas in, in the maintenance area where we're not able to get those people because of our salary. We, we know that up front. Ms. Cartner, can I interject just for a minute? Maybe I can help clear you up on this. If I'm in incorrect, Ms. Clutch, please tell me. The reason that we've got the million dollars set in there, Carolyn, is in the event that the state does give the teachers across this state a 3% increase, then we have to provide the same thing to the locally paid people, which is the local money. And I mean, how would you feel if the state give the state paid people an increase and we hadn't made provisions for the local people to get their 3%? And well, you've got the 3%. That 3% that's, that's, that's on there. The million. That's that million that you're talking about. No, the million's the salary study. This is something completely different. Is that, is separate. that, that That's separate. completely different. That, but, okay, so we, we need to address that a little more then. The, okay. the, the line uh, item for the three, there's a line item for 3% in the local, and then there's a, and a line. And how much is that, Kelly, offhand? Because I don't have that paper. 816. 816 plus there's a million. Okay. There, there's two different. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying if we're going to, we're doing this three plus this million, this million, I'm saying we need to look at something to say, okay, maybe on this million, we need to come back and say, all right, we need something like having, all right, we know IT, we know this, maybe come up so we can present when this is presented to the commissioners what this is instead of saying, well, this salary said we want this million. I, I'm just being realistic in this. We have to propose this. If this is, you've got, I think we've got to have a better understanding with this. And if this is for this, what this is for, or come up with a more of a realistic number, what this is for. I mean, the, the rest of this board may not feel this way. I'm just saying where I've got a problem with no, it. No, you're exactly right, Carolyn. I, you're exactly right. But the thing is, though, you have to make some type of provision, though, because if the salary study comes back, how can we ask the commissioners for something that we, we didn't even have it in the, the proposal there, the proposed budget? It's got to be there. Now, we won't have the salary study results probably till, what, sometime in May, Kelly? Mid-May, maybe? Wait, May. May working very hard and say this will be before our presentation to the commissioners but we know there's two areas we know right or maybe more than that but some of this we know that's why i'm saying 
this is something that we we do already know and that could possibly be done but just to throw a number out there and with what we've already heard with some of the other things that's been going on with what we've heard with uh, figures what revalves done what is done I, I mean I'm just being realistic about what we've heard and so I would like to maybe see what we would be looking at with some of these other job positions uh, with that but that's that's some of the concerns that I have but I was wondering about that three percent if that did just just for the teachers. And again, I know this is up in the air. It depends on what the state does. I understand that completely. And if they don't, you know, we would still be in in trouble with that. But that's the only things I'm concerned with. Good analysis, Ms. Carpenter. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Monnett, you have your comments? I don't have any questions. I just want to thank you for going to all that trouble to, to thoroughly or, you know, look into the, the question that I was asking last time and the reason I was asking it is still the same the public does not understand what a wonderful system they're getting for the dollars that they're paying in taxes and I would imagine the commissioners don't know these facts either so I would suggest that we take this material to our May 10th meeting and not be you know um, Oh, I can't think of the right word uh, just as for an in information mm -hmm. because they need to know that this is where we are and if we're going to get additional funding to pull us out up from some of those low numbers it's going to have to be local money because we are fortunate to be a wealthy county mm -hmm. and so we're victims of our own success and, and I think they need to understand those that data Thank you, Ms. Monnett. Also, and Ms. Patterson is our teacher liaison and also part of the budget committee. Would you like to make a comment or any concerns that you have? I know, I know you was quite active in our budget meetings, and I appreciate you for all you've done there. Okay? All right. And, and what I wanted to say was uh, when it comes to the funding as far as us ranking 111th out of the state, that kind of thing, when you look at the academic performance that Cabarrus County Schools has historically had I don't know that I would give up the funding for the academic excellence that we're getting I mean that's what the job is that's what all of our jobs is is to get kids through high school get them graduated with the highest awards and the highest grade average that they can have and so uh, if we had more funding you know we might get a little bit lazy or something be honest with you you know I, that's not really a, maybe the right word or but that we just get you know a little bit content sometimes and so when we have to fight for everything and we still exceed you know that's the true uh, parts of a champion it's a champion school system there's no doubt and uh, I wish the funding was a lot better and uh, but for now it is what it is and we're thankful for what we got but now I'd like to ask uh, board members if for a second round if anybody has any comments just let me know further and then we're going to call for a motion huh. I'm good. Mr. Chairman, I just want to yes. comment on Mrs. Minot's comment that we are a wealthy county. I will respectfully disagree. We are not a wealthy county. Um, I think that was a, a good reference maybe even more than 10 years ago. But right now we're looking at over 9% unemployment. We have the high majority of our schools at 40% or higher free and reduced lunch. That is not a sign of a wealthy county. So I just want to, I guess, state my comment that um, we have people all over this county who are struggling. And it is, um, I'll just say, I, I don't think it's fair to use the term wealthy and Cabarrus in the same sentence anymore. Okay, Ms. Blackwater, do you have any comments at this time? Okay, all right. Mr. Cogger, anything else? I just want to make a quick comment on, on Ms. Carpenter's uh, point on the million. I, I guess I understand what you're saying about having something tied to it, but t to me, what the, the reason we did what we did, it's a placeholder. We, we don't it's a known unknown we don't know what that million represents because the salary study is not complete the whole point of doing the study was to find out where the shortcomings are to then see where, where can we plug a hole I don't disagree with you it's a whole lot better to go out and tell somebody here's what we're going to do with these specific dollars but the fact of the matter is and the whole point of doing it was to have a placeholder just to see if there are places where we can plug a hole for a need to get us through till the next time around based on the information that we quite frankly are spending a lot of money 
to go find out. So anyway, that's just, um, I don't totally disagree with what, what you're after, but I, I think it just needs to be pointed out the whole point of that line item is a placeholder. Mm -hmm. that is, that's true, Mr. Kiger, Ms. <coughs> Ms. Carpenter. Yeah, but a million dollar placeholders, <clears throat> not real good when you don't have any money. Um, and that's where I have a problem. And, and uh, unfortunately, Blake, I've been through that. And I hate to just, I, I respectfully disagree, uh, because the county went through that before. And you got to have a plan in. You're a plan person, and you got to have a plan in place. And and we really don't have the plan in place. And and I like to have the plan in place and have those numbers in place. And I'm a number person, and that's why I've got problems with that number. And also, I still and I said it earlier. And y'all are. This is one time y'all are going to disagree with me. I, I hate to see this, but uh, it is because I still feel that, and I mentioned this at the last meeting, and again, I, I still feel that we, and I know we had put those numbers out there, I still feel that we do need the, uh, uh, the, the, the individuals, uh, and this was discussed in our budget. Again, we, we discussed this at length, trying to get the, uh, individuals back into the schools, the facilitators, uh, and Cindy, we had talked, I, I know you had talked about it, and you said that you thought that, that maybe it wasn't needed, you know, where we had taken the two, uh, two from each of the individual schools, um, and we f took them from the smaller schools, um, uh, the tech facilitators. Uh, but I tell you, we had, it wasn't just one or two of the groups during the budget committee, but all the elementary schools seem to really need those two techs back. And I really feel that we needed to get those back into the budget. And again, um, I, I feel strong that we do need them, though, back, them back, back into the budget. And it's gonna be roughly $100,000 to do that. And like you talking about getting the classroom size back down small, I feel those tech facilitators need to back back in, especially with us having to go back in and going to do the the classrooms and doing that testing online. I think that's something that's desperately needed. So that's my two cents worth, and that's where I've got some heartburn. Well, unfortunately, you know, Ms. Carpenter, I think all of us has got a little bit of heartburn for the way things have turned out, not only for the school board members, but for the, every, everyone. And uh, that's just the way it is these days. We're hoping it gets better. And it's a million. Mm -hmm. Chances are we probably won't get it to start with. And so we're making a fuss for nothing, really, because we probably won't get it. And as far as the teacher, I mean, the tech facilitators, and you know, you know, I wanted to see teacher assistants put back on there. But, I mean, I know you're, we're on the same page. There's a lot of things that I wanted to see us do. And the system had all of these uh, committees. And they wanted to, we saw the increases. They had to bring the decreases in their budget to offset the increases. But at the end of the day, we found out, though, that the giving up was not worth the getting. So we just left it like it was with a flat budget. And that's what our proposal is tonight and the way it's presented. But anyway, I do thank you for your concerns, and if the board wants to continue that, we will. Otherwise, Ms. Minot, I'd like for you to f make your final remarks, and then we're going to move on with more discussion or a vote, whichever the board wants to do. Uh, I really don't have any uh, particular thing to say. Perhaps, Ms. Uh, Furtenbaugh, I should have used the word comparatively wealthy, because obviously that is the case if that's the way the state is funding us and we're not getting it for these disadvantaged children. I mean, that there, there's a reason we're not. Um, I would have, I'd love to see those figures too, but I'm not gonna ask you to look for them. I'll poke around and see if I can find those myself. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I could just give a clarification on the, lo the low wealth small county that um, Ms. Klutz spoke of. That formula for the state, and um, Senator Hartzell even agrees about it, he hasn't, seem to have been able to affect any change there in Raleigh for us, um, that once you get 70 to 80 percent of the school districts who meet a criteria that was supposed to be an exception additional funding, something's backwards. And that's where it is now. There's, I, th I believe it's close to, Kelly, do you know for sure? I think it's close to 80 percent of the districts get either the small district or low wealth funding or both in the algorithm. Kannapolis gets that money. 
We don't get it. Um, and the reason being our size in, in ratio or comparison to the amount of free and reduced lunch. So you can take one district that's the size of one of our feeder districts. And if we take our feeder district, for example, maybe um, if you look at a, um, a culture and web, urban elementary, feed to Concord, middle to Concord High, that feeder district, if they were alone, not that I want to go back to city districts, but if they were alone as a district, they would get all kinds of extra funding. Unfortunately, you throw in a Hickory Ridge High School and Middle School and a Cox Mill High School, and those numbers dilute our ability to get that extra money. So it's not that we don't have the needs, but when you throw in a couple of the big schools, the high population areas that do have a little more wealth, they dilute our ability to get the funding. So. Okay, board members, I'd like to ask Dr. Shepard if he will. He was real active in the budget process also. So Dr. Shepard, if you'd like to talk. I just want to add one other point of clarification. Uh, it, the, the funding that we're talking about, the low wealth funding, uh, largely is a result of the Leandro decision and the decisions made through Judge Manning, and that has affected education. But there's a whole other piece that we don't look at, and that is the Department of Commerce and how counties are tiered, and we are in the lowest tier, which means we're one of the wealthiest counties as determined by the Department of Commerce for whatever reason. So we have to fight this battle not just at the educational front, but also through, uh, and, and I would encourage you if you want to go start somewhere and look at that, that, that would be a good place to start. I learned a lot uh, coming here and, um, and, and, and trying to figure out why it is that we get fewer dollars than many of our other sister school systems. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. Okay, board members, uh, what's your pleasure? You want to discuss this some more? You got some more co questions, more concerns for Ms. Klutz? Or are we ready for a motion? I think we're ready for a motion. Okay, all right. Then I'd like to entertain a motion that the 2012 2013 uh, budget be uh, approved as presented for the proposed budget for the commissioners in, the, in our meeting in June. So moved. I have a motion. Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. Okay, motion carries 6-1. Motion carries, Ms. Monroe, you got that. Okay, Ms. Klutz, you've got your approval there, and we'll be talking more about this between now and the time it gets to, um, to the commissioners so we can make a very good presentation to them, and hopefully we'll see some good things happen between now and then with the salary study and some other things that will uh, fall in place for us, I hope. Okay, board members. The uh, last member, uh, the last item on our agenda. No, we got two more. We got the approval of uh, policy 7425, school administrator contracts, Carolyn's favorite subject. And so, if you've got that up, 10.2 uh, policy 7425. Got Miss Dr. Sane at the podium. Now, uh, so Miss Sane. Pull this up. forget there's a mouse up here and I need to use it okay uh, school administrative contacts uh, contracts policy 7425 these were the recommendations from North Carolina School Board Association that we change the word certificate to license and that was the only change do you have any questions that was from the uh, NCSBA yes Okay, board members, do you have any questions about this policy? Notice that it, the changes were recommended by North Carolina School Board Association. Uh, yeah, we can. And we'll start on Ms. Monnett's side. Okay, Ms. Carpenter, you have any comment? No, no, you I just have both. Okay, Mr. Cogger, you have any comments? I jumped the gun and already. That's all right. Uh, you just, okay, Ms. Blackwelder. Uh, and I apologize. I know this question is probably a little bit uh, delayed since I was not at the work session. But as I'm reading this, this is all over the place to me. Um, let me read how many paragraphs down. Third paragraph down, it states that initial contracts between a school administrator and the board shall be for a term of two to four years. Then it says four-year initial contracts will be granted, and it gives the reasons. Uh, then you go down to two-year contracts, and then you go down to, in addition, one-year contracts may be granted to individuals who hold up, you know, subsequent contracts between a principal or assistant principal and the board will be granted for a term of four years. 
that is just so all over the place to me. It is hard to follow. I could not work under these conditions if I was hiring an employee. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have an issue that we don't either chronologically state who qualifies, why you would do a one year versus a two year versus a four year, and then why you all of a sudden get a subsequent contract, no matter whether you did a one year, two year, or four year, automatically a four year. This makes no sense to me. I'm going to defer, uh, defer to our school board attorney on this. Uh, well, we certainly can reorder the sentences if you would think that would be clear. Um, it does, all the provisions in here do track the, um, the general statute um, that governs this, which says that they can be for two to four years and, and so forth, and then have sort of a carve out provision um, for the provisional. I think that's in there for sort of those um, exigent circumstances where they need to to get someone hired. Well, I apologize. I, you know, I probably, instead of raising a question, should have had a solution, and usually I can find verbiage, but I, I don't understand why we have, that is in such disarray, you know, where it starts and, and where it stops, and the, the last sentence is, you know, an automatic four years, or can be, I guess, no, and it says it will be granted. Will be, not can be, or shall, will be. I, I just have issues with this, and I'm gonna vote against it if there's not a answer because I'm, I'm having a problem with the, we you know we've talked about contracts to begin with, but this is all over the place. So unless we can come up with something, I'm, I'm going to have to actually vote against it myself. Well, Holly, keep in mind now this is this is an existing policy, just changes. And I, I mean, understand it, but policy. we have local authority to yeah. reword. Well, sure we do. Sure so we do, my issue I, is we have to align, or we should align, but that doesn't mean we can't change it to reflect our feelings and our opinion on sure. it, and I don't follow this at all. Okay, Dr. Shepard wants to comment on this. Well, I saw Kathy make her way. She may be going to make the same point I, ha I, I am, but I, I would think that one improvement, and maybe it's not enough, but the first part of the, of the paragraph is about initial contracts, and it talks about the different links for different reasons, and then the last sentence is about the subsequent contracts. So if they are renewed, then we have no choice but to be for four years. So maybe that's a separate paragraph altogether. I don't, that's just one observation. Can I just restate just what you said? Okay, that's, I get the subsequent contracts, but is that on a one-year person that goes to a two-year, to a four-year, or does that? one to four? Yeah, what, what gives yeah. you your subsequent four-year contract? What criteria do you meet to get that? I get it that it's a subsequent contract, but is it, it can you get a four-year just after you've had a one-year? Do you get it when you've had a two-year? That's my question. The one-year contract would be for a provisional person. That would be very rare. I don't believe we've even had a provisional assistant um, principal in the last few years. Um, but if it was one year, then the person would get a permanent certificate. And I would assume at that time, and I would need to check with Sarah, that we'd probably start the normal <coughs> cycle of the two-year contract. Once um, that first contract has been awarded for um, a person with continuing licensure, the permanent type of licensure, the subsequent contracts have to be for four years. We do not have a choice to make those shorter. Okay, so I just want to ca recapture what you said, and I get it that the subsequent contract, I got that part, it being the very last sentence, but my issue is, even if it's rare, is, is this contract going to come always to us, or does the superintendent get to grant that one-year contract, and then it comes to us as a two-year or four-year recommendation? Yeah, they would all come to you. So they all come, they would all come Give to me, you. for instance, why we would do a one-year. I've, I've never even heard that term since I've been on the board, and that's since 2004. If we had a particularly stellar person who might be near the end of their assistant principal education and for some reason seem to be the best suited candidate for a school, we can get a provisional for that so, person while they're finishing their credits to okay. complete that certification. So that's why you wouldn't recommend an initial two-year contract? Right, because we don't know if they're going to complete their certification. So why would we contract them at all? It would be, I, I, we have this in here for a rare circumstance. As I said, I don't believe we've done this since I came. <clears throat> at the same time, it is a protection in the event that there was something that came up where we would want to do that. A However, protection for whom? For the district, <laughs> okay. if, we, if we wanted to do that. If I may make a suggestion, perhaps we pull out the one-year contract to a separate paragraph so as to not confuse the issue so that we have one paragraph in which we explain what the normal process is but then maintain that exception in there for a one-year provisional in the event circumstances arose and we needed to provide that. 
Okay, board members, before we go any further, the uh, camera guys need to change their tape. You want to take about maybe a 10 second break while they do that? Okay, uh, we have Ms. Blackwater's comments now. Ms. Furtenbaugh. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I'm going to offer another suggestion to that paragraph because I too was struggling with that. Because <laughs> I, I have one question, Sarah. I thought we could offer two year contracts to administrators ongoing, but it has to be four years all the time? Yes, the statute reads in the case of a subsequent contract between a principal or AP and a local board, the contract shall be for a term of four years. Okay. Um, I would like to suggest from the word, this is just going to be a movement around sentences. So in the paragraph, keep the first sentence, initial contracts shall be for a term of two to four years. And then say, can, is that absent unusual circumstances required for wording? Is that in the statute? The On the third sentence? On the third sentence. Because what I'm thinking is it needs to say, Initial contracts between the school administrator and the board shall be for a term of two to four years. Then you say, two-year initial contracts will be awarded for individuals who do not have experience as school administrators. Then, third sentence is four-year initial contracts will be granted only to exemplary school administrators. That is one complete package in sequence. You have a cho choice of two or four. Here's your two. Here's your four option. That's a package. That's, mm -hmm. That concludes. Then you say... Um, in addition, one year, con or actually, then you say subsequent contracts between the principal or assistant principal and the board will be granted for a term of four years. Then you have your one, two, four year continuation. It's in order. I think the problem is that the language is out of order. And then you separate out that last sentence, the addition, in addition, one year contracts may be granted for provisional. Um, so I think if we, if we have it sequenced, it's same, same wording, just sequence it. And, and unless we need that absent unusual circumstances, I think it's just extra words. We, we do not. I think that's just recommended policy language, so we can certainly delete okay. the absent unusual circumstances. But Holly, do you th agree? I think it'll flow better if you say, here's the beginning, here's the middle, here's mm -hmm. the end kind of thing. So, You know, I hate to be redundant, but my, one of the issues, I think this is odd that it states in there, and I'm not sure. I guess it's the beginner. I'm not sure, but when it states that... Um, where they don't have any experience, I've lost where, where it is. We automatically give give a contract to somebody that has no experience? To your initial will be granted. The two, is that for their? Yeah. Two instead yeah. of four. Yeah, just out of school. Hmm. Or out of their grant program. Yeah, I like your verbiage better. It's still, I have still some issues with it. I'm not sure why. I've never, I guess I've never had to deal with this particular policy mm -hmm. before, but. We can do one of two things. We can. Uh, we can defer it back to the policy committee to work on that paragraph um, and put it in with first read for next meeting, or you can pass it with the changes that Ms. Furtenbaugh suggested, and I'll shoot you a copy of it uh, just as soon as we get that changed. Ms. Okay. Furtenbaugh, you have some more? Well, I'm just going to say, I, you know, I'm okay if we just pass it and say just sequence this the sentences kind of in chrono almost chronological flow there so we'll, be glad well either way it's going to, have to go back to the policy committee anyway because they'll have to do the reverbage and restructure the uh, sentences and all that anyway Is no that i'm saying right? i'm saying mr chair that we don't need to go back to policy we can just say we're using the same wording except for absent unusual circumstances mm -hmm. and so all you do is Number the sentences and reorder the sentences, and yeah. it's and we pass it tonight, and it's finished. Yeah, I could be, I could go along with that. That's no problem. Mr. Fur, do you have any comments that you'd like to add? All righty. Okay, then. So what we'll do then is we'll entertain a motion to approve this policy uh, with the changes that Ms. Furtenbaugh and Ms. Blackwater have suggested, and we'll bring it back to the board for a second reading in May. Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion? Pardon? Let's, let's it. Mr. Chair, I, I would suggest, and even though I am not wild about being mandated to have four-year contracts, I will clarify that. Mm. I would like to make the motion that we approve this tonight with the resequencing of the sentences in this particular paragraph, um, and we move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's what I was calling for. No, yeah. I'm not saying bring it back. 
in May. I'm saying approve it. Well, approve yeah. It. Approve it as it is and don't bring it back for a second reading. No, approve okay. it with the reordering of the sentences. Okay. Well, that's, 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 that's even, no, this is, the, this is the first reading, isn't it? Is this not yes. the first reading? This is, yeah, this is, this the, first is the first reading. time. And so that's what I was saying. We bring it back for a second reading and it should be in order at that point. That's well, We correct. can approve it for the first reading tonight yes. and then yes. bring it back in the, in the correct format and everything for our second reading. Is that right, Ms. Stone? Okay, so okay, now yes. I have a motion from Ms. Furtenbaugh. Do I have a second? Second. Damn, second it. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? No. Okay, no. motion carries 6 0. Ms. Monroe, you got the that. Okay, 6 1. I'm sorry, 6 4. Two. I voted against that as oh, well. Oh, you did? I, I didn't did. hear you, Ms. Blackwater. So it's 5 2 then, Ms. Monroe. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, board members. You know, getting a little contentious tonight here. All right, let's look on down at the uh, board calendar, and let's see if we can't get this ironed out here real quickly on the 2012-2013 board meeting calendar. And you have this as it's presented. Uh, and so there was some talk last week for the, uh, I mean, week before last about the meeting in Mon uh, on Monday, July the 2nd versus uh, Monday, July the 9th. Uh, and we discussed it for a little bit, but you wanted to put it off until tonight. All right, tonight's here, and so we'd like to entertain this, and we'll start on Ms. Minot's side if you have any comments about the uh, schedule of meetings for 2012-2013 for the board. Uh, the only comment I have is about that July the 2nd situation, and I think someone else pointed it out that customarily the week of the fourth is is a holiday for families and to me it makes sense to have the meeting on the next Monday however I have no objection to having it on the second um, but I just think it, it might be with as many people as come to the meetings I don't know of all the people that are required to come to the meetings or what you're going to handle that night that you're going to ask people to come whether that's going to be a problem to have it on the second Okay, Ms. Carpenter. Uh, that schedule's fine. I mean, at this Second. point, it's okay with me. Uh, I know it was balled up that normally they do, but this year, that's fine with me. So. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Mr. Kiger. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. I, 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 we briefly kicked around some of the reasons of why we did what we did, and that, that's... Uh, you know, neither here nor there at this point, but I'm, I'm okay with what we've got. Okay, that's fine. And uh, Ms. Blackwelder? Ms. Uh, Furtenbaugh? Well, just to reiterate my comments before, and, and Ms. Minus as well, historically, we have kept that week open. The rest of the staff knows we should not be making calendar decisions in April based on when people scheduled vacation because that has historically, even for businesses in town, they close one week a year, and it's the week that involves July 4th, regardless of the day of the week. So I expect to be here either date, but I think sometimes we try to reinvent the wheel. And maybe, as somebody said tonight, it's good in certain cases. This is so simple. It's never been. There's been always been one meeting in July. It's <coughs> always been the second week. I don't know why things have to get changed. Okay, Mr. Furr. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and call in sick. I won't be here. <laughs> just, just that's the way it goes. Well, are you are you you so you so you won't be here either way then? Okay. Uh, well, you know, like I said last time we talked about this, it doesn't matter to me either day, and uh, you know I don't know whether people plan I, July the fourth week. Some plan bef after, some plan before, and this that and all. And there's one thing that I've learned after working on this board for ten years now. You're not going to please everybody. And you're not going to satisfy. If you do 50%, you're doing good. I mean, and I'll be honest with you, that's just the way it is. And I have no problem with it being on the second. And so, um, you know, I I would like to see it stay the second. And uh, if I can get a motion for it to stay the second and the calendar be approved as it is, I'll accept that motion at this time. I'll make that motion. How All about right. that? Ms. Carpenter makes the motion that we accept Monday, July the second, and the rest of the calendar. And do I have a second on that motion? I'll second that. All right, Blake seconds it. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Nay. All right, if you had nay, let me see your hands. One, two. One, two. Was you nay? It doesn't matter to me. Now, how can I call it when you say it doesn't matter to me? All right, do I have three? 
All right, I got two against it. Four, it's five to two. Everybody on this side's good. It's five to two, Miss Monroe. The calendar goes forward. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we don't want to negatively affect anybody. I mean, like I said earlier, I don't want to be redundant, but it's impossible to imp to make everybody happy. We try to do the thing that's right, and uh, you know there was reasons behind this, and I think it is the right decision as far as I'm concerned. But with that being said, board members and ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's time for us to convene in closed session. Uh, that is pursuant to General Statute 143.318.11A6 to consider the qualifications, competence, performance, character, fitness, conditions of appointment, or conditions of initial employment of an individual public officer or employee or prospective public officer or employee or to hear or investigate a complaint, charge or grievance by or against an individual public officer or employee and pursuant to General Statute 143.318.11A3 to consult with an attorney employed or retained by the public body in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the attorney and the public body, which privilege is hereby acknowledged. Do I have a motion that we convene in closed session? I have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Finally, a 7-0. Okay, good night, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you back in May. Board members.